Hello and welcome again to Black and White. I'm Mike Hickson and John Shannon is with me today. And John, we're glad to be together and we're going to be talking about a program that we began last week, Denominational Doctrines versus Divine Truth. Thank you for having me, Mike. And it's a pleasure to be here and uh, it's always a privilege to study God's Word. Yes, it and is. And to present it in a loving and kind way to the viewing audience. Thank you for watching. That's right. And we hope you'll stay tuned for the next half hour. John, as we begin our study today, we began this program looking at two Old Testament examples. The first was Josiah when they found the book of the law. And of course they recognized that they had not obeyed the law of God. And so they needed to make a restoration. And then we also looked at Naaman, uh, who was a leper, a very powerful man, instructed to dip seven times in the River Jordan by the prophet Elisha, and uh, became irate at the command given to him to uh, enjoy cleansing. And so we began there kind of laying a foundation. And, and I think sometimes, you know, we look at, well, Naaman, for example. What Naaman thought the prophet should have said was quite different than what the prophet said. Right. And so what he thought wasn't in the message. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of folks in the religious world today, John, what they are doing religiously in their heart of hearts, they may think it's in the message, but upon further investigation, it's not. Now, you know, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. I remember years ago, Brother Garland Elkins said, concerning that verse. He said, you know, that implies some things aren't good. Well, we got to make sure that we put to the test what we believe and practice because we want to make sure that what we believe and practice is true because ultimately, when it's all said and done, when the dust settles, truth's going to judge us. Right. Truth, truth is, is what's going to judge us. But, It'll save us, but it's going to judge us. But, and, and so, you know, when you look around in the religious world, there are a lot of messages that we hear that upon further, deeper, more meticulous investigation, uh, the conclusion is, you know what? This isn't biblical. Now, I know that the religious world, here's what the religious world says. There are many bodies or churches. We're all a part of that one big universal body. It really doesn't matter what church you belong to or what doctrine you practice. I mean, that, that's really irrelevant. All right, I know what people say. But what I want to know is, what does the truth say? So the, the, the world says many bodies or churches will do. What does the Bible say? That's exactly right. And you know, um, when you, I said earlier, when you start researching, I, I challenge you, even the members of the Church of Christ, don't, are you a member of the Church of Christ because your mother is? Or did you research? See, I'm not a member of the Church of Christ because Mike is. He's a friend of mine. And I'm just going to join the Church of Christ. Oh, no, 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 none of that. I'm going to become a member of the Church of Christ because Mike is and we're friends. No, 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 no. Do your research. You need to know how the Church of our Lord is set up. In other words, is spiritual in character, makeup. And you know, you need to know that the Church of Our Lord is a spiritual institution. It was set up by God. Listen to me carefully. You need to do your research on the one that you're in. In other words, now if you're going to write a paper on the church that you're in, can you use the Bible on your system, your organization, the, the origin? the organization structure of the church that you in. Wait a minute. I, I hear this all the time, Mike. Uh, we say he's the pastor of the church. Mm -hmm. The pastor of the church. What does that mean? And we use it lightly, and individuals, I know what they're talking about. Yeah, I do too. He's the pastor. But have you ever did any research on pastor? Have, do you know what the word where it, where it originated, uh, there's another term used, uh, bishop, pastors, overseers, 
uh, Presbyterian, uh, shepherds, all of them. Are they talking about different uh, men or the same group of men? See, you have to do your research. Now, is there a difference between an evangelist and an elder, pastor? What, what, what does the Bible say about it? You know, I hear people saying all the time that Paul was a pastor. And not a pastor. Not a pa Well, and see, if you don't know, well, you're saying that Paul was a bishop. Now, Paul was an apostle. But if he had been a pastor, a bishop, he had to be married. That's exactly right. Now, can a woman be a bishop? Now, just, just, just think a moment. See, if when you don't know Scripture, you just take anything, and people just share. Uh, please listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. Denominational doctrine is not from God. It's been concocted by men and women who are working for Satan, who are dissatisfied with just the plain New Testament teaching. That's all it is. They, have, they are dissatisfied with what the Bible teaches, so they have come up and devised a system to make money and to hoodwink people. And most people don't know that. Now, let's, let's just think a moment. Why do all of these different denominations have their own book? Hmm. They got a creed, a manual, a catechism, a confession of faith, something different from all other denominations. But they claim that Christ is the head. All right? If Christ is the head, have you ever saw him? No. Well, have you saw him, Brother Shannon? No. Well, have you ever talked to him? Yeah. Has he ever talked to you? Yeah. How does he speak to you through this book? What'd you say? He speaks to me through the book. Now, the message that the Lord speaks to me, he speaks to everybody. He does not speak to me in a way that he doesn't speak to you. He speaks to us through the book. Now, if you don't understand that, and you think that these so-called pastors and ribs and uh, senior pastors and uh, uh, pulpit pastors and, and uh, so-called one bishop or one church, who ever heard of one bishop in a local church? That's not New Testament. See how far away from the pattern right. churches have gotten? Right. The earth, listen, let, let me just do this, Mike. There was a church at Jerusalem. There was a church at Antioch. There was a church in Alexander. There was a church in Rome. And there was a church in Constantinople. Now, this is years after the New Testament church got started. And each one of them had a bishop over that particular area. That was unscriptural. <laughs> See? And they said, well, you know, he's a bishop. He's a bishop. Well, what does that mean? There was never one bishop in a local church. God did not organize the local church. The local church, it would start off with having an evangelist. Evangelists come in and preach, baptize people, teach people how to be elders, train to be elders, and they're elders and deacons. Evangelists, elders, and deacons, members. And the elders in that local church were not over another congregation. And you didn't have one pastor over the church, pastor, elders, deacons, overseer, I mean, a bishop, a, a shepherd. That's the same, same group office. of great, that's same right. office, that's right. same group of men. And it could never be a woman. But now, uh, preacher, that's confusing to me. The reason it's confusing to you is because you never read it in Scripture. That's right. All you see is the stuff on TV. Now, uh, it, it was never, it was no such thing. The, the, Jesus Christ doesn't have a woman preaching in his church. No. There's some woman teachers, but a, a, a woman cannot usurp authority over the man. Now, you won't know this until you do your research. That's right. I'm speaking from 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. But see, since you don't read, you don't know this, 
And I'm trying to school you and trying to get you studying, do some research on women pastors. And see, John, a lot of folks, you mentioned, you, you mentioned parents or grandparents. A lot of folks are what they are because that's what their mom and daddy was. They haven't done their research. They haven't done the research. They, they don't have a faith that'll stand on their own. Right. Like Timothy, all right? So you've got to do your research. What you're saying about, for example, pastors. I know in denominationalism, the, what's common is you have the preacher who serves as the pastor over that church. Well, when I go back to the, to the record, to the pattern, I find in Acts chapter 14, they ordained elders, plural, right. in every church. Right. In Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Paul said he left, he left Titus in Crete for the purpose of setting in order right. things that are lacking or wanting and, and ordaining, ordaining elders, elders every in city. every city or every church. In other words, in every city where a congregation existed, you ordain elders. Well, now, what kind of men? Men that meet the qualifications. Meet, see, the Bible, God's Word, the New Testament here, gives the pattern and gives the qualification of these men uh, that's called elders, bishop, pastors, overseers, shepherds. And there's not a woman in there. No. Wait a minute. He'd be the well, husband three, of wait, one wait, wife. Wait a minute. One of the qualifications is that he must be married the husband of one wife. Well, how can a woman qualify? Now watch this now. How can a person call himself a bishop and not even marry? And don't have children. Can't do it. Wait a minute. See how far people are? And I'm not uh, doing this to be unkind. I'm just trying to inform you correctly. Because we have so much foolishness in the religious world. And all I can see from television and all of my life, all I ever saw was religious racketeers. They know that they're wrong, but because of the money, the money is so good and the position is so good, and they like that hierarchy, they like that praise, they love, and I think Jesus said, that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination before God. And all that stuff, and I could go on, and you could talk about the Masons, the Eastern Star, the Shriners, the free will mason, the Scottish Rite, and the York, all that stuff, none of it's in Scripture. And they'll tell you it's not a religion. Oh, they got a worshipful master. So what I'm trying to say is, start doing, I'm talking to the audience. You, you just common everyday people. Start reading and research. Write a paper on your church. Write a paper on your, the way it's organized and see does it matter, which matter, uh, match with Scripture. Is that good, Mike? Oh, it's good because, because ultimately when it comes down to it, what we want to do is follow the organizational structure set forth in Scripture. In Scripture. Because, yeah, you know, and what you said about position and finance, I, I remember uh, some, some time back I was talking to a brother and he had been to, uh, he had gone to a denominational school to get a doctorate degree. And if I recall correctly, it was affiliated with the Baptist Church. And he said that in the language class, in the Greek class, I believe it was, he said the professor said to the class, he said, the Church of Christ has it right on Acts 2.38. Now think about that. Here's a guy who knows the, Greek, the original language, and he said that what we teach in the church what, 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 what we teach, what we say the Bible teaches is right. So I asked him, I said, well, whatever came of that? Did, did he ever do anything? And he said, well, he said, I think I, as long as I was in the school, he thought about it. He said, but I believe position and finances ultimately trumped him doing what's right. Well, see, you've got to make a decision sometimes. Would, would it, would it, yeah, you know, you think about, you came out of the Catholic Church. Let, let's just say here's somebody who's a cardinal in the Catholic Church. Man, you got a lot of clout. If you're, a, if you're in the College of Cardinals, you, you got a lot of clout in the Catholic oh, yeah. Church. If you're a, a bishop or a monsieur, you got I've a lot seen, of clout. Yeah. You, you got a lot of clout. So you learn the truth. Now the question is not, the, the question is, 
Here's the truth. You say it's truth. Are you willing to obey it? Are you willing to walk away from position and finances for truth? And that's, that's not easy. And I, I can sympathize with you, but you have to make that decision. You, do, you know, there was a, there, there was a, I heard a story by Brother William Woodson. Uh, Brother Woodson was a great Bible, Bible scholar, great teacher. He told a story. So he heard the, the, the fellow tell the story. And uh, he said he was at a gospel meeting not far from, uh, uh, not far from, from here, where we are right now in Olive Branch, Mississippi, uh, around Tupelo, I believe it was, just north of Tupelo. He said there was a fellow in the Lord's Church preaching a gospel meeting. He recounted uh, something that had happened early in his life. He was preaching for the Christian church. And he said that uh, one of his members in the Christian church was a, mem was a friend of a lady who was a member of the Lord's church. And this was up in Kentucky at the time. And so at the time, he was a Christian church preacher. And so he told the member in his church, he said, you need to talk to your friend and, and tell her that uh, her preacher needs to have a debate with me. And they were going to debate on instrumental music. And so he said, we set up a debate. Brother Woodson is relaying all this. And he said that uh, they had this debate. And so the Christian church preacher said he got up and did his 30-minute uh, presentation. And the preacher in the Lord's church got up behind him. And he went to the chalkboard. And he said, he wrote down on one side of the ledger, seeing. And he put Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16. Then he put over on the other side of the ledger, on the chalkboard, he put play. And he said, now I put what we do. We sing, and here's the verses. He said, I put what you do over here. You play. He said, now just put your verses down. He said, when he said that, he thought, oh, so he said, I got up, did my next presentation, and I said, gospel preacher got up right behind me, went back to the chalkboard and said, now look, I put what we do up here, and I gave you the verses. And he said, I put what you do. I want the verses. He said, after that uh, session that night, the elders in the Christian church said, we need to meet. And so he said, we went in the room and sat down, and the elders in the Christian church said, we were embarrassed tonight. That preacher said, this is what we do, and he put down sing, and he wrote the verses down. He said, he put over here play, and he said, for you to put the verses down, you didn't do it. And he said, brethren, I don't have a verse. I don't have a verse. And so this like on a Monday night, Sunday or Monday night, he said by Wednesday, by about midweek, he said, I got to thinking, this debate is not between me and this gospel preacher. It's between me and God. Well, make a long story short, after the meeting or after the debate was concluded, uh, what, what that preacher had done started him on a quest. And he finally realized I'm in error. He went to the elders of the Christian church and told him, he said, brother, I can't preach here anymore. He went down to the, down the street and visited with the preacher in the Lord's church and he said, uh, I want to use the rest of my life to preach the truth. Now, the point of all that is, here was a man who had a position and he had finances, but he learned the truth. And he was willing to walk away from position and finance to obey the truth and become a child of God and preach the truth because it was that important to him. Some folks won't do that. So the question is, you know, Jesus talked about having an honest and good heart. I remember Franklin Camp. You and I, we love Brother Camp. Brother Camp said one time, if you don't have an honest heart, you don't have a good heart. No. So what we're talking about, John, this, this, not, this, this, this right here is life and death, what we're talking about. Either, either you obey the truth and are saved, or you'll obey error and you'll be lost. Right. And I, I think we need to be, I'll say this again, uh, as gentle as I can uh, to present the truth. Sometimes when I'm preaching, it may seem a little harsh, but I know where you are. Because you've been there. Because I've been there. I know the feeling I'm, I'm say I'm okay and the church I'm in is fine. And, but uh, can you 
pass a test if someone started inquiring about your church and your system, are you afraid to look into it and see if it's right or wrong? Are you, will you do that now? You, you just gave me a thought, John. Yes. And I think you've talked about this before, all right? You, you know, sometimes when, when people have been accused of a crime, they'll take a lie detector test. Yeah. And you either pass or fail. Well, God has a religious lie detector. Well, what is it, John? That's it right there. Can you pass that test? Right. That, I mean, that's the key. That's what we're talking about. And sometimes um, um, we as members of the Church of the Christ, sometimes we think that people ought to move as soon as they hear truth. Well, it's not like that. Sometimes it takes years because the first time that I heard truth, I completely turned it off. And I was a, a, a kid, but I knew something was wrong. So, but I, I challenge you uh, to take some time out of your busy schedule and start doing some research. Investigate. Investigate. And one of the good things in this world, if you, before you leave this world, learn how to use this book. Listen to it. Learn how to use it proper. You need to learn this book so well until you'll know when a person is making a mistake and you can know when they're right or wrong. You don't have to be uh, crazy or wild or just overbearing, but you can come up and say, no, that's not right. And the reason it's not right is because you have accepted this as the standard of authority in religion from God for the whole world from now on out. And once you learn this, nobody will ever be able to trick you. That's right. Nobody. Once you learn the standard, they can't trick you. That's why you send your kids to school so they can read and write. Why? So they won't be tricked. And, and you know, John, think, think about it religiously. We hear people say, well, you know, uh, one church is good as another church. There are many bodies, many churches. Well, I agree. There are a lot of churches out there. There are many bodies, many churches. But the Bible says they're just one church or one body. There, there are a lot of folks that are in denominations today that have been founded by men. And we can go back and we can do our research and we can find out who started those organizations, right. can't we? Right. Uh, we can find out who started every denomination. Right. All right. Can we find out who started the church revealed in the Bible? Yeah. We can, can't we? Sure. So can we give book, chapter, and verse for that? Yeah. We can. Matthew 16, 18. Who built the church? Well, Jesus did. So if somebody tells you that the church that they're in was built by some man, John Wesley or Charles Wesley or some other person, is it the church that you read about in Scripture? And... It's heartbreaking when many individuals have put their time and money and years of dedication to something. And I believe some of the preachers the same way. I believe there are some preachers perhaps that's watching this program don't know the history and the background of their church. And they don't really know what to do to be saved but they, they know the system that they're in very well. Yeah. They know that system very well. But will that system stand up against this system? Now, Mike, uh, I said time is going, but you're talking about the denomination. Sometimes individuals will say to me, well, the Bible talks about the seven churches of faith. Mm -hmm. It does. Wasn't that a different denomination? You're talking about local congregations in a certain geographical area. They were located in Asia Minor. For example, in Galatians 1, Paul writes to the churches of Galatia. He's not saying that there are different churches. He's just saying there are different lighthouses, different congregations that are located in a geographical area. Now, there are local churches. For example, the church at Ephesus or the church at Laodicea, the church at Sardis, those, the church at Colossae, church at Philippi. But there's one universal church. 
I had a guy, I was preaching one time talking about the one church, and a guy came up to me and he said, you said there's just one church, but there are seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And I said, you've got to understand, those were congregations. There's a difference there. There's one church, one body, but there are varying congregations all over the world, aren't there? That's right. And uh, I often tell them, I said, there was seven golden candlesticks. Yeah. Not brass. Gold. Zinc. And I, all of them made out the same thing. And uh, That's good the text says, and what thou see it, write it in a book, book and send it to the seven churches. That's right. So they all received the same book. That's right. Same book. They, they all follow the same thing. I've made the same thing. See? I mean, could you imagine, you know, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 talked about how he preached the same thing in every church. Hey, can you imagine if Paul went to Corinth, preached one thing, went over to Ephesus, preached something else, then he went here. That, that's what goes on in the religious world every week. Right. Uh, Matt, I mean, think about like at James Road where you preach. If you got up Sunday morning and you said you need to be baptized in order to go to heaven, because that's what Paul said, or rather what Peter said in Acts chapter 2, then Sunday night you got up and said all you got to do to become Christian is say sinner's prayer. Then on Wednesday night you got up and you said, you know, the Bible says there's one church. Then next week you say, you know, one church is good than another. How long would you be in that position? Not very long. Why? But people can see the inconsistency there, right. but they don't see it religiously worldwide. Here's Paul said in Second Corinthians. The eyes have blinded the eyes of the mind of them that they believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. See, and that's that's why we need to be very careful and very easy trying to get people to study. That's right. If we can get you to start reading and research and reasoning. You're going to be fine. You, you, know, you know, John, you just made me think that uh, the, greatest, the greatest ally the devil has is a closed Bible. Closed Bible. You know, in Revelation chapter 20, and I know it's highly figurative, but John there talks about the binding and loosing of Satan. You know, if you want to bind Satan, preach that word. Right. You want to loose him, let him have havoc. Just don't preach it. Don't preach it. Don't teach it. Don't open it. That's good. Let me tell you what, man. It'll mess you up. John, we've got a minute left. What would a person need to do to become a member of the body of Christ you read about in Scripture? And one, you need to know a little bit about the body of Christ. Who started it? Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, Upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary. The Lamb of God, John 1, 29. He died. He shed his blood. They took him down and buried him in Joseph's new tomb. He was raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. Mark chapter 16, verse number 9. You've got to believe that. You must repent of your sin. Change your mind about sin and stop it. Come out of stuff that's not in the scripture. Confess your faith in Jesus. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you know what, if you do that, you'll have the crown of life. John, as always, thank you, and thank you for being with us. God bless.